Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie creator interview. It is your Cape Crusader, Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with our brand new guest, Delchi. We're here to break down Nodoy 2 and everything in between. How are you doing? And welcome to the stream. Hey, great to be here. Uh, you know, having a lot of fun. Uh, this is my first serious comic effort, and uh, I'm really enjoying the experience. I'm learning a lot uh, as I go and uh getting my story out there which is what it's all about i had the uh the opportunity to read uh the first chapter first issue uh on global comics and whew, it, it took me on a ride that i was not prepared for to be honest with you and then i noticed there are 11 you know 11 in total uh and with you currently working on the 12th one correct yes there, there are 11 issues out there uh 12 is in production i think we've got two more pages to ink on 12 and there are two trade paperbacks uh one covering issues one through five and two covering six through ten man that is that is so awesome so before we dive into this story too much let's begin with you how did you first get into creating comics what were like some of your very first steps into uh, the industry uh i wrote this story back in 2001 2000 2001 the story was born uh, on the back of a napkin uh, in the middle of a 24-hour cafe down in the East Village. Uh, I had been out uh, golf clubbing with my usual cadre of friends. There was a little tight-knit group of us, and uh, we were just talking about ideas for this and that. And I've always been writing. I've been a writer, you know, not professionally, just you know, goofball writer for ages. Mm -hmm. And so I started making this story. And then years later, it was like, you know, this would make a great movie. I want to make this into a movie. And then I saw what it would take to make it into a movie. And I said, you know what the hell with it? <laughs> and then one night living in San Francisco out on Treasure Island, I was on my back deck and I was just like watching Clerks 2. And they had that jailhouse scene where they're like, you know, what is your excuse why don't you just get off your dead ass and do something? And I'm like, you know what? Fine. I'll make this into a comic book. I'll make it into a graphic novel. And the next morning, I started figuring out how much money I could save out of each paycheck. Uh, I started going into Reddit. Um, I've been friends with uh, a lot of people who are very successful in the comics industry. And, uh, you know, I've, I've met them, talked to them, hung out with some of them. And uh, they gave me some really good pointers and some excellent advice. And uh, they went on to become ridiculously successful and famous. And, you know, I, I, I'm really happy for them. And at the same time, I got advice from them when they were just starting out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that was a key thing. And then uh, I sat down one night and started writing. And I haven't stopped since. Uh, I That's went so on awesome. to the... I went onto the internet and I interviewed artists and I found out the one most important thing you can do as an indie comic creator and it will get you more success than anything else you could possibly do. Pay your artist. Mm -hmm. Not you'll get exposure, not <laughs> you'll get 10% of everything. I pay your artist. My artist gets paid before anything happens. Well, yeah, because artists have, uh, they have families to feed too, right? Like, uh, they can't feed them off exposure. Exactly. And by doing that, I had a completed work in hand, which made it a hell of a lot easier to get it into comic shops. It made it a hell of a lot easier to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it, when it came time to talk to uh, Emerald uh, for distribution over on, in the SeaTac area, uh, you know, having five, six issues already done, inked, bound, printed, ready to go, was a big plus so pay your artist and and don't go out there saying i've got a great idea but i need someone to do spec art for me for free i paid for the spec art you know and and you, you pay 25 50 for some very basic spec art you get three or four pages and that puts you ahead of 90 percent of the crowd mm -hmm. No, and uh, I think that's a really good mentality to have too, because you form a really good bond and relationship with that artist. You know, that artist knows that you're serious, that you're ready to take everything on. Uh, you know, and I think that really 
eases into the artist you know writer relationship what was that creative process like with you two in the beginning you know uh how with this being like your very first like step into a serious take on it you know was that a, kind of a hard learning experience for you it wasn't it wasn't um i was incredibly lucky that i found anna uh what i did was i went onto reddit there is a uh, a reddit that was called comic book creators and i said hi uh, i have a comic book idea uh it's paid i need an artist and who's interested and about eight people responded and i said okay eight people give me two pages of concept art based on this script and they sent me what they sent me and i got everything from manga to anime to uh you know just dirty sketch 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 like you know pencil sketch mm -hmm. and anna sent me something that resonated with me and we talked about it and she's i sent her the rest of the script and she's like you know this story speaks to me and so i sent her the, the, the first couple of scripts and she said absolutely yes i'm in and the thing is a lot of it a lot of what you see visually is her interpretation of my words i only direct her when i need to like no this club had a wall here and the bar was over there when it comes to character creation i leave as much to her as possible and she's really surprised me at every turn because she's managed to create characters i would have never thought of mm -hmm. uh i mean from an aesthetic point of view and she's brought things to life that I couldn't possibly describe. So I really feel I'm like one of the luckiest people in the world to have found <laughs> her and have been working with her. Yeah, it really goes to show you how important it is to let your artists have some creative control, you know, over what they're doing. Because in, in, in some cases, they can add a lot to like the panel or to the picture that maybe you weren't like originally conceiving of. Exactly. Or they can take some liberties that make you sit back and say, wow. So can you tell us a little bit about what this story is about? I mean, we kind of broke down the what went into creating it. Um, give us a little bit about like the concept of it, you know, the, the, the protagonist, the story behind the protagonist as well. The story is based loosely on Finnish mythology. Uh, there is the, the, the Finnish national epic, which concludes that has the... Uh, the origins of the earth and the gods and goddesses who were created and the adventures they had and so on. And what I did was I branched out from that. I made a side story based on characters from Finnish mythology and then inserted my own story. So the story is based on a fiction that I made inspired by the Finnish national epic. So what it is, is uh, the goddess of the sun and moon has a daughter. And they named her Noidutu, which translates to spellbound. Now, how that came to pass was as she was growing up, she was taught various things. She was taught music. She was taught art. She was taught crafting. But she also loved to dance. And what they found by accident was her gift was that when she danced, all sorrow, sadness, helplessness, hopelessness was just gone, eradicated. Anything that made you feel like hell, like made you feel sick, any self-doubt, self-worry, it was gone. And what happened was, as it does in most good stories, it caused a conflict inside the pantheon because the people the, the rulers of hell especially the queen of hell took umbrage to that <laughs> because sorrow and agony and pain is her domain mm -hmm. and putting it there or taking it away is her decision not the decision of some daughter uh, of the goddess of the moon so she called for her to be killed and there was a great uprising about it uh, there was a lot of fighting and in the end they all agreed that she would not be killed she'd be exiled she has to leave the tree of life and live on the earth and she has to pay a tithe to hell 
to remind Hell that, you know, Hell is actually in control. So she has to sacrifice a soul to Hell every so often. And in return, she gets to live. And her mother grants her the ability to see everything in the past, not the future, mm -hmm. but the past. She could hold an object and tell you the entire history of the object. Like, say you, you hand her a vase, she'll tell you about the river where the mud came from and the person wow. who killed it. Oh. And, you know, whatever. All she has to do is reach out and touch it. But she doesn't know anything about the future. So she's exiled to Earth and she's left to her own devices. Now, the story picks up in the year 2000 in New York City with a man named David Waters who is an NYU graduate student who's doing a double in mythology and archaeology. And his thesis is about the story of the Noidutu. And he has spent years researching this and reading the myth and, mm -hmm. you know, looking into it and learning about it, travels to Finland, uh, you know, meets actual real shaman and uh you know not the touristy types not the ones that are out there to collect money off the tourists and uh comes back to new york and he lives an ordinary new york city college student life you know goes to the clubs goes to school has a job but what happens is he presents his thesis and it gets shot down by the review board and he refuses to give up mm -hmm. And his advisor keeps telling him, his professor advisor tells him, give up, give up, do something else. This is not worth it. And what happens next is uh, David basically says, no, I'm not letting this go. And his advisor says, are you prepared for what that means? And he's like, what are you talking about? Professor, what, what are you talking about? And the professor writes down an address on the card and hands it to him and says, be there at midnight tonight. Ooh. <laughs> and long story short, David finds out that not only is this not a myth, it's real. The Noidutu is real. The story is real. But that almost every mythology out there is real. Mm -hmm. And they live actively on our planet. And in New York City, they've actually divided the city up into segments. And different mythologies own different parts of Manhattan. That's so uh, he comes crazy. To find, he comes to find out that the NYPD was founded by Irish vampires. <laughs> vampires that were kicked out of Ireland and sent to New York along with all the other people that were considered undesirable. And it goes through the history of the Tammany Hall riots and how the NYPD was founded, but that basically the vamp the cops are vampires. Not all of them, but the ruling section of them, the majority of them are all vampires. Werewolves own the rails. They own the subways, the trains, because a lot of them, when they're young, they want to hide from the full moon. So where's the best place to do that in New York? In the tunnels. Yeah, yeah. Which is over time have bought the east village for cash they own the east village immortals have taken over the club scene and they own all the clubs in manhattan and they just change the owner's name every now and then and rotate through as they've been doing this for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and there are even ghosts there's a ghost that owns a bar in hell's kitchen <laughs> <laughs> and slowly, little by little, David comes to realize this. And he starts meeting these people and he doesn't believe it. Mm -hmm. He thinks it's a bunch of garbage and uh, he doesn't believe his professor. He doesn't believe anybody until one night he gets mugged on the subway and a werewolf saves his life and becomes his new best friend. Dude, this story just I I I just scratched the the tip of the iceberg. Holy crap. <laughs> now, the the conflict is this though. The Noidutu is in Manhattan and she is sacrificing people to hell because she has to if she wants to stay alive. 
other than that, she lives a pretty ordinary existence. But it's upsetting the balance between all the mythologies in New York. Very slowly, but very surely, it upsets the balance. So when she's like sacrificing people, it looked like she only went for like scumbags. Is is that the the case? Like exactly. For, okay. She her her she only goes for either scumbags or people that threaten her. She doesn't just willfully go around killing, but you don't realize that till later on in the story. Mm -hmm. the, the story develops because I spent a lot of time world building. And so each issue, you learn something new about the, the under, underlying world. So what I've just talked about will be is like the first four issues. Yeah. And you literally get a, a, a lecture almost on how this mythology came to be how this mythology interpret incorporated itself into New York and what they do. There's even a supernatural cleanup crew that works out of Central Park. Mm -hmm. So like if a werewolf gets hit by a taxi, they go clean it up so that nobody else has to see it. Yeah, I like that. That's like, it's like you have answers for every question that could be asked possibly. I, I love how diverse all the different like mythologies and, and creatures are that are ruling the different parts of Manhattan are uh, as well. Like what was some of your inspiration in moving in that direction? A, a lot of people I met when I was in Manhattan, I was a club DJ for many years and I got to see things that no human being would ever normally see. Uh, I've, I've seen clubs that are perfectly normal. I've seen clubs that you have to know somebody to get into. Mm -hmm. I've seen clubs that don't exist. Like you go into a building, you go down 10 flights of stairs, you go across two more buildings and you're in the basement of a small place where nobody really knows about it unless you're told. And uh, I've seen some things that inspired me. I just sat back and watched and I'm like, this is, yes, this is what this could be. I watched the birth of the, uh, the New York City vampire scene uh, the SCA scene, the Society for Creative Anachronism, uh, you know, see, you know uh, the hacker scene, things like that. And I took elements from them and mixed them together with mythology and then thought to myself, OK, if you were a werewolf and you're in Manhattan, what the hell would you do? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I met people and I talked to people, people who lived in storm drains, people who lived in Astor Place, people who lived on the Upper East Side. And, you know, I got a feel for New York and kind of brought it into the story. No, that is awesome. I think right now is the perfect segue. Let's go ahead and pull up the first part of this on Global Comics. And we have, you have 11 uploads on Global Comics. Are you planning on doing most of your, uh, most of um, uploading on Global? Or is there any yes. other place that you're going to be uh, eyeballing soon? I tried different places and they were all problematic. They all had their issues. Uh, I, you know, their software didn't work. Their upload didn't work. Converting the comics didn't work. Global Comics was the first place I went to where everything worked. I fed a PDF in one side and a digital comic came out the other. That, and when it, when it works miracle. perfect, that's the, that's, the, that's the best, right? That's the money. And, you know, for right now, I'm trying to promote this. So right now, you can read all of these for free. Uh, you can buy the books if you like. I have a store where you can buy them from. Mm -hmm. But you can read them for free. And eventually, you'll, there'll be electronic downloads that you can buy. Uh, right now, you can't download. You can just read. But it's helping me get the word out there. Uh, the trade paperbacks do the most business. And my trade paperbacks have attracted some really interesting attention. Uh, the people who are writing my forewords are really well known in the industry mm -hmm. and people who write commentaries are very well known in, in social circles. So I'm getting some traction and the rest is all hope. So right here is the cover. What was some of your inspiration with just starting off with uh, the character design of the, you know, of, of uh, the Nodoitu? What happened was uh, the, 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 funny, the funny story is the opening of this story where you have the DJ inside of Manhattan who sees this person dancing and is suddenly overcome by magic. That actually happened. That's a true story. 
And that's where the inspiration for this came from. It came from being in the goth clubs of New York City in the 1990s and seeing people dancing and, and mingling with each other and living the gothic lifestyle in New York mm -hmm. City without apology, without uh, hesitation. And I saw some of the most beautiful things when I did that. I've also seen some of the most horrible things, but that's where the story was born. Yeah, and you can see in my in, in inside of every issue, I do a, a one page commentary. Mm -hmm. And this talks about the origin of the story and where it was written. Unfortunately, that place no longer exists. Yaffa was shut down years ago. No, it, I, I really like that sign too. That it, it looks like it'd be a nice place to sit down and get some work nailed out. It's where a lot of people did that. A lot of people did work from there. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Voltaire, uh, the the Gothic singer, performer, writer. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of his early work in that place too. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, yeah. It's a shame that uh, that it closed down, though. It's always sad when when places like that of importance like that, yeah. uh, you know, meet meet their end. Nine Eleven gutted New York City. And it was never the same again. So we start off after this um, with uh, the Tree of Life. So this is an interesting design for this tree. So uh, is this kind of how it's portrayed in the Finnish uh, a mythology? Yes. There's a very specific tale where it tells you how the Tree of Life came to be, uh, how the, the origin egg was made, and so on and so on. Uh, it's really great reading. And then we uh, we dive in a little bit, and I I, I like how uh, you begin with like zooming in on the Earth like this, like with the light, and then we go into Manhattan, then the, to Fourteenth Street. Did Fourteenth Street have any importance uh, to you uh, as like an individual, or was this something you created for the story? That club, Mother, actually existed on Fourteenth Street in Manhattan, and there's a lot of tribute in this story to people and places inside of Manhattan during the years that I lived there. Uh, clubs that I went to, people I knew, uh, mm -hmm. people I met. Uh, so there's a lot of reality in this story. Uh, you can go to 14th Street and see where Mother used to be. And yes, the the, do the doorman at the club did wear a top hat and uh, <laughs> not much else. <laughs> And then we're also and introduced to David as well. Yes, that's where we first meet David. And then we see him heading into the subways. And then right here, you said uh, there was another interesting uh, story that went with uh, this kangaroo. Uh, you care to kind of uh, dive into that a little bit for us? One night, riding the train home from clubbing in Manhattan, I was all by myself on the train. And I looked at the seat across from me, and there was a beanie baby kangaroo <laughs> all by itself and i just looked at it and it looked at me and i'm like well you want to come home with me and so it did and, and uh, uh, it's a kangaroo with a joey so it's a she mm -hmm. and uh was nicknamed l train because that's where i found her <laughs> and uh, this is where people are looking at david wondering you know if he's passed out here if he's drunk uh, yeah, well, that we, that's we, what the text that's what the text is all about mm -hmm. if you read the text it talks about that how you know when you're the, the the standard substandard club victim you know coming home on a Sunday morning and you know you just want to be left alone and get home as soon as you possibly can yeah you know, you've had your five waters you've had your uh, you, you, you've had your bacon a bacon and egg uh, bagel you know you just want to get home Mm -hmm. And people look at you and they're like, are they drunk? Are they going to pass out? Are they going to throw up? And all you're really thinking is, how soon can I get away from these people? <laughs> and I, I love this uh, initial uh, meeting with the friends and how uh, he like despises being called Dr. Jones. Uh, what was uh, the importance of that? Well, his, he, he does a double major in archaeology and mythology. And yes, those do exist. You can go to NYU and look and you can see the where they teach that. And uh, Adrian is a, uh, 
she lives in the same building as he does. And she thinks it's cute that he's studying archaeology, so she calls him Dr. Jones after <laughs> Indiana Jones. Okay. All right. <laughs> and that annoys David to no end. Mm hmm. And then, you know, he he sort of makes his way home and then finally he's safe. Mm -hmm. And he has a cat uh, named Edison, who is, you know, his, his one true companion. And, you know, he gets home and just crawls into bed and turns on the radio. And goes to, you know, listens to the radio while he's going to sleep. And he happens to catch a, uh, a radio show where uh, they're interviewing a local DJ from one of the clubs. And this is one of those, you know, sort of foreshadowing moments because David eventually becomes friends with that DJ. Oh, okay. And then we kind of and get our first... Oh, go ahead. The DJ ends up becoming friends with David and he ends up introducing the entire story through his own story. I was going to say, we also get a nice introduction to uh, the Nandoitu over here, too. Uh, I didn't read, I didn't at first notice this was her uh, until I, I, like, glancing over this again with the fingers. The fingers are very distinctive with this character. Exactly. And the thing is, that's the way the story builds. Because you, you, you don't get spoon-fed the story. This is not the Three Little Pigs. You don't already know what the outcome is. And you're getting revealed parts of the story as it's being revealed to the characters in the story. Mm -hmm. You only know as much as David does. And the more David learns, the more you, the reader, learns. And I love this, like, the visual, like, this art is just gorgeous. The way, like, she's dancing and her hair is, like, flowing into the panel. It's, it's like I said, I'm one of the luckiest people alive to have an artist like Anna to work with. So this tells the story of uh, DJ Demetrius and how he came to be a DJ. He was a horrible DJ. He, he, he told him, he says himself, he said, I sucked. And then he, he decided to play this piece of music that had no reason to be played inside of the club. Mm -hmm. It was William Blake's Tiger, uh, the poem done by Tangerine Dream. And the Noidutu what happened to be in that club, and she just walked out and started dancing. And that's when she released what I refer to as the old magics. And Demetrius had no idea what hit him. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that the, the next day he went and bought an entire DJ kit. He went and started training himself to be a DJ and everything, the magic of it all just amplified what ta what little talent he had and the next thing you know he's a DJ playing all the big clubs in Manhattan That's awesome, was that any sort of like reflection on your journey as like a DJ -er? Yes No, oh, that is awesome yeah, that, that, this, this part of the, the story is actually a true story that's awesome, man. That is awesome. I, I always love seeing like bits of, um, you know, someone's real life experiences told like in the point of view of a comic. Like, how did it feel getting that out there in this medium? There's an old saying uh, when you start to write, the people tell you write what you know. Mm -hmm. And it really is true. It's very true. And I took what happened, uh, one experience that happened to me and used it as a gateway to tell a greater story. That's awesome. But now it also fosters a strong belief in magic, not rabbit out of the hat, but like John Constantine magic. Mm -hmm. That, you know, good and bad and ugly and everything and how that incorporates itself into New York. <clears throat> so what happens here is the interview at the radio station ends and Demetrius is talking to Gabrielle, who's the host of the show, but she's also a performer. And uh, she's like, you know, I never knew that story about you. And meanwhile, David is laying in bed, reading a book on Finnish mythology and listening to this and not realizing that 
he's listening to what his future is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to the night Demetrius was talking about when the Noidutu leaves the uh, the club and she's walking through uh, the park and gets approached by a scumbag, which happens quite a bit in New York. And it's clear he is going to do some damage to her. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's one really important thing that a lot of people don't notice. If you want to scroll up a little bit, she's not leaving any footprints. Okay. Yeah, no, I see that. Yeah. I didn't notice that either. That, that Yeah, that's... So, w what causes that is, is I mean, because she has f a physical form, right? She is. She has a physical form, but she's the daughter of a goddess. Her feet don't actually touch the ground. That yeah, that is and, a really uh, astounding like attention to detail there. Holy crap! <laughs> and you'll you'll notice it in in different parts of the book. You'll notice she never leaves footprints behind. Mm -hmm. And so, so he, he pulls the knife and says, "You know, I know how to talk to people like you." Mm -hmm. And she turns around and gives him the business. This was probably, I was telling you earlier, like one of the coolest scenes I've seen. Like, I loved this whole entire sequence of like hitting him in the chest and then all like everything like piles out of him in like perfect like organization. Exactly. It, everything, every major system in his body gets thrown back about two feet and then drops into a pile. So, bones, circulatory system, organs. It just drops into piles. And you can see his spirit coming out of the piles. Mm -hmm. And then she literally tells him, go to hell. Is that what that means right here? Yes. And then we have uh, the hounds of hell, hell reaching up to grab him. Yep. And that's it. Yeah, that is brutal. I, I love this whole entire page, like this and this, like both of these were just because I mean, this entire time we're, we're reading it and we're not introduced to this level of like, you know, like how graphic and poten the potential for how, how graphic it can get with her. Like she is a beast. Exactly. And yet she's sleeping in the rough out in the snow in New York City. So is this like a spiritual, like a spiritual animal, like coming down to give her warmth? Yes. Okay. Yep. Exactly. And then we we have the ending pages right here. So, uh, well, what's uh, what's the story behind this? Is this like a poem? It's paraphrased from the opening of the finished text that the story is taken from. Uh, it's an invocation. Whenever you're supposed, when you're supposed to invoke this, whenever you start telling uh, a folk tale or mm -hmm. a history, uh, it, it's it basically it's it's asking the gods and the goddesses to uh, you're you're saying that you're pure of heart. I'm driven by my longing and my understanding urges, and now I'm going to tell the story, and this is the story of our people. This is the story of our legend. And you're asking to tell it correctly. Uh, it literally, in parts of it, translates to the words are frozen in my mouth and now they are thawing. The words are now falling out of my mouth. And it basically what it means is I'm about to tell you a story mm -hmm. and I'm telling it in good faith and as best as I can remember. And then I paraphrase that around to the title, Mina Orlin Noidotu, I am spellbound. Yeah, I would have never, pronunciations are like, you know, doing interviews, it's it's funny, Believe but pronunciations me, are my weak suit. And I, I, I remember like looking and I'm like, I don't know how to say that first part. I don't know how to say it right. <laughs> well, oddly enough, I actually created a opening song for this, which you can find on SoundCloud. And you'll Which, can hear how most of these words are pronounced. The song is sung both in Finnish and in English. Which we could put as a backing track in post-production. So we'll actually have that music playing while we're going through the comic together. 
man this was such an awesome sit down thank you for breaking down all of that with us today and uh before we begin wrapping things up let's go ahead and start talking about what's next so what's on the plate for you in the future you know what's coming out i know you're working on chapter 12 but is there any other like comics or anything of that nature that might be out there too there are uh there's a second title i have called tales of the omniverse and i like to describe it as uh the twilight zone meets raymond carver uh, I know that's a little esoteric. A lot of people haven't heard of Raymond Carver. Uh, he was an amazing writer and storyteller. And so Tales of the Omniverse is basically taking stories about ordinary people and telling them. Uh, the first one is called The Hat. And it's a story about two people who meet each other in a mosh pit at a punk rock show. <laughs> and they absolutely hate each other when they first meet. And they overcome their own prejudices and uh, and disbeliefs, and by the end, they're friends. Uh, the second one is the tale of the uh, the uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, the tale of the mistress, and it's a story about a woman who uh, is a well, not a woman. It's a story about a car full of goths on their way to a convention, and they get caught in a hurricane, and something happens. And their lives are never the same again. That would be horrifying. Yep. And there's a third, uh, the, the Tales of the Omniverse, they're, they're, I've got them planned up through five. Uh, there's one called Quantum Entanglement. There's one called High. Uh, they're, they're, they're all in the process of being refined and written. The thing is, I, I, I don't do any kind of crowdfunding yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't made the brave step into doing it because it's kind of complicated and I don't want to make any bad steps. I don't want to be the person leaving people holding the bag. Like, you know, I can't produce this, but you already put your money in. Mm -hmm. I want to be in a position where I have a well-oiled machine where money goes in and product comes out before I go to people with my hand out. Yeah. And I'm getting very close to that. But I'm putting all of my available funding into Noidutu, and everything else is sort of on hold or happens in between or, you know, happens when I can. Uh, I've got a third title called Last Call, uh, which is the story of a Las Vegas superhero uh, by accident. Uh, he's a bartender who ends up uh, through a series of very bizarre events, ends up with a bottle opener that came out of a UFO. And it transforms him into a superhero bartender. Ooh, that sounds fun. It, it, it was really popular, but nobody was buying it. But they were loving it, and they were reading it, and they were taking the free copies. And then my artist that I had for that project quit. And I just put it aside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm looking for an artist to take that over, to, to work on with taking that over. And my most recent project, which we just broke ground on this week, uh, I'm working on a board game that is a tribute to the Dead Milkmen. And uh, it's called Stuart. And yes, it does involve a burrow owl. <laughs> no, it sounds like you have a busy plate ahead of you. That is, that's awesome. I'd love to see uh, dipping into... Uh, things outside of the comic realm as well and going into like the gaming part of things that has to be pretty exciting it is um i get bored easily that's the problem <laughs> and and sometimes when i get crazy ideas i actually write them down and do something with them oh that is awesome so before we end things 100 percent completely i always love ending things on a strong note and that is asking a question in particular because as much as this is a podcast where we uh, really deep dive you and your book. We also like to ask questions uh, for anyone who might be new, who might be interesting in starting a script or even just jumping into the comic scene themselves. So with that being said, for anyone that's out there having troubles just getting started with writing or, or creating, what type of advice would you offer them to help them push through that? Two things. One I've already said. Uh, number one, yes, you can do it. Number two, <laughs> pay your artist. Those are the two things that are going to get you further than anything else because self-doubt, self-neglect is going to be the number one thing that kills you. Mm -hmm. 
Now, are you going to become famous? Are you going to be the next Spider-Man? Are you going to be the next whatever? No, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees that you're going to get anywhere, but you'll be happier for having done it. You'll be poorer for having done it, but you'll be happier for having done it. But the thing is, is that it's better to say, I tried to do this and to just sit there and say, no, I can never do it. Mm -hmm. I did that to myself for over 10 years. I never believed in my writing. I never believed in my stories. The only thing I ever believed in was my DJing. And I got good at that. And it went places. I mean, obviously, you know, the the scene has changed and I'm sort of like, a, Hey, I, I the, the running joke is I'm not a has been. I'm a never was. I aspire to be a has been, but <laughs> once you reach the, the, the crowning achievement of becoming a Jerry goth or a geriatric goth, uh, you know, things change to the point where, Oh yeah. I remember back in the day when remember back in the day when it, 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 that's what you're saying, but you know what? You had that day. You had that time. And one of the greatest things I ever did was when I first put this out, I ended up with a fan from the middle of Wyoming. I mean, middle of nowhere, Wyoming. <laughs> and she wrote to me. And so I wrote back and she asked all kinds of questions about the story and, and, and where it came from and the or and she read books and she just became a super fan. And what I did was I had a custom one page story done for her. So that's saying, awesome. you know, thank you for being, you know, our huge fan. And I had it framed and shipped to the comic book store where she buys the comics. And we set up a camera and a, a, a live talk session, a zoom, a zoom meeting. And she walked in to pick up her comics and there it was waiting for her. And then there I was on the uh, on the live chat saying surprise. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. And I got to tell you, it was one of the greatest things I ever did. And that's one of the main reasons why I got into this, so I could have that interaction. Mm -hmm. And I can be that, you know, that person that does that. Oh, that's awesome i man th this has been such an awesome sit down i i loved exploring the world uh i n have never really dove into finnish mythology so it was awesome to see just how insane it could really get holy crap seeing her palm the dude's like flesh and and vital systems out of his body like that was just it i, I remember i was scrolling through it and i was like holy crap like i i, I was like D is this still like am i still on the same book like this is crazy like it was it was awesome i love the deep behind the scene looks at it too thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with us uh yeah thank you where could everyone find you on uh, your social media platforms oh uh, i've got a twitter account and i uh, i have a, a website called entropic designs where i sell things and uh, that's about it i don't do anything else social media wise at the moment i i did have a reddit and a facebook page they fell into disrepair so i've got to got to get those going again so for right now, the, uh, the the Twitter account is the, the number one way to reach me. All right, absolutely. And those links will be in the description if you're looking on Facebook or YouTube. That being said, guys, it is a beautiful Friday, so it is time for us to wrap up. I hope you have an awesome day, but most importantly, keep it geekly.